Welcome. My name is uh, Odd Gurven. I'm project manager at Norwegian Cognitive Center. Uh, today we have a special topic uh, introduced by Tor Setre from Experis and Alexandra Diem from Experis. Uh, Tor. Thank you, Odd. Uh, and also, please welcome uh, to all the audience uh, where we're going to uh address the uh, uh the security and safety within ai and especially also using the bow tie as a, a method for storytelling so i'm just going to share the screen now just a moment okay good thank you um we just uh, uh just a very couple of words for where we come from uh we just attended the Norwegian cognitive center as a associated partner um, and uh, the experience also uh, located in the Nordic region, in both Norway, Sweden, Finland and Denmark. So uh, based around also the AI uh, machine learning initiatives, uh, we have also some, some complementary uh, services to, to, uh, to approach it a little bit more holistic also point of view. So, um, uh, also to covering the digital transformation, cybersecurity, operational IT support, and cloud and infrastructure, and business system, ERP, we have also as well, uh, and including the academy uh, um, initiative, also where we can have upskill and reskill for, for uh, within the different competence area. So, uh, okay. Um, our initiatives here uh, regarding the AI uh, and uh, also especially my background with the operational side. Um, uh, I would like to also to, to, uh, to introduce the, the bow tie methodology um, and um, also how we can build a storytelling, how to understand the risk picture also uh, about the different threats and also the barriers and to avoid the oh shit, and also to mitigate the risk and to reduce the likelihood of consequences. And uh, then I would also like to introduce Alexandra, and uh, also we have uh, also some very special guests with us afterwards. So Alexandra, a couple of words for, from uh, you. Yeah, thank you, Toinge, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone to this event. Uh, my name is Alexandra Diem. I am yeah, the AI and machine learning lead at Xperia Cyber. Um, I've been there since May last year. And before that, I was um, a scientist in applied mathematics, mathematics and mathematical modeling of biological systems um, yeah, for the last eight years. And so I came to Xperia Cyber uh, to, um, yeah, bring machine learning solutions into um, the projects that are being, uh, that are being offered from, uh, from Cyber and Xperis. And I was contacted uh, by Toinge, who told me about this bow tie method of um, yeah, risk analysis that um, is basically seemed really interesting to me from the very beginning, because it seems, a, it seems like a great way of um, yeah, introducing data and data analysis into the risk management process. And uh, also I would like to, to uh, wish welcome also um, uh, Cohen van der Gullek. Um, and also we would like to, to, what do you call it, introduce uh, uh, a data-driven approach uh, in combination with the uh, model, because it's uh, possible to put it alive not only to draw a picture and image and storytelling around it, but uh, also to, to make it a data-driven approach. And uh, to get a little bit more insight, uh, that I would just uh, also please welcome uh, Cohen. Uh, you can also introduce yourself in, in uh, this context. Well, it's on the slides, really. <laughs> so, uh... Yeah, my name is Koen Gulik. I'm a researcher at TNO in the Netherlands. I'm a visiting professor of the University in Huddersfield. And uh, I work as a uh, research fellow at uh, Delft University of Technology on digitalization of safety management systems. So that's uh, in a nutshell what it is. 
please go ahead to get a little bit more in deep insight. Uh, just to come there uh, after the after this presentation also as well, there will be uh, some information that we can also help you uh, intend it to, to follow up uh, if case if any interest also as well. All right, thank you. So that's a full screen presentation, am I correct? This is a great, great, okay. Well, thanks for inviting me for this event. Uh, I'm, I always like the opportunity to speak about the things I'm passionate about and the kind of work that I do. So I'm very happy to be here and to, to speak about them. So I've turned my presentation preparing for safety AI with bow ties because it's it's a special use of bow ties within a, uh, uh, I guess, a special approach to use bow ties to make things AI ready. We have done some minimal AI work, but the the the, the the gravity of the work is really on designing the system to prepare for AI rather than do the AI itself. Um, just a bit about myself. Page down, perhaps. There we go. So um, I'm a chemical engineer by training. Uh, it was about uh, a long time ago, finished that. After that, I did a PhD at Delft University. There was an aerospace technology, so this all this black smoke here you see uh, on the right hand side that was on very engineering side of things I discovered there I had a knack for more the social side of things the more human side of safety so I went to back to Delft University uh, taught uh, safety science for seven years there also some of my time shared with the University of uh, Antwerp in uh, in Belgium where they were setting up safety course at that time after that, moved to the UK for five years, working as a professor on safety, uh, safety of our rail, rail risk and reliability. And that's really where people started asking me, you know, what can a digital world do for us in this, in this particular environment? So this is how it got the ball rolling to the point where we are now. Now back in the Netherlands, I'm applying that, you know, transposing that from railways into occupational health and safety, chemical industry and some other. Maybe as a side note, I have a good memories of working with Norwegians before, I've been the co-chair of the ESRO conference 2018. Maybe some of you remember that was with um, Stein Hugen in, in Trondheim. So that's good, good memory there for working with Norwegian. So glad to be here. So I'll just start just stepping back a little bit on, on why we're doing this in the first place. And um, in terms of safety and reliability, that's just great expectations to be had when we talk about digitalization. And the kind of things I get asked about, you know, whether projects, whether talk to students or, or customers, it's, it's these five things mostly. The first thing we want is just lots and lots of data, risk historic database for better risk prediction. So the idea is if you've got lots of beta, data, safety will be better. Actually for reliability and machine components, we know that works, but for safety, trying to prevent people from dying in accidents, it's still a bit out there. I think the judgment's still a bit out there. So that's an interesting one. So, but that's why we are interested. Second one, people ask me all the time, can you do real time? Can you do real time risk-based decision making? Well, the answer is in theory, yes. In practice, doesn't necessarily help. But people do ask me, what if I got an app on my phone? I'm boarding this train now. Don't get into it. It's going to derail in five minutes. It's that kind of things that we hope that this digital world will bring us. I think that's still a long way off and maybe not necessarily what we're looking for either. We want AI to make our safety decisions easier, help us make those decisions easier, better by getting more information. Uh, that's definitely something to look forward to. I think it's still also a long way off at this point. Now we have lean safety management for efficient delivery. And that means cheap, okay? So I don't have Netflix because I like IT. I have Netflix because it makes thousands of movies very cheap, okay? So one of the promises of IT is not necessarily how beautiful it is, but just makes things cheaper products become cheaper, uh, uh, content becomes cheaper. So that's really what we're looking for here. And the last one is an interesting one. When you've got sufficient AI engines, for instance, like in text analysis, you can actually engage staff in discussions. So let's say you, you have a chat bot that actually, rather than just saying, give us all your data, you can actually interact with people and it can actually feel some inclusion in there as well. This is an interesting aspect that we're working at here too. You know, I actually won't be speaking about that here. Okay, but in the long term, I think all safety management systems in their entirety, front to back, will be digitized entirely into data uh, systems. And it's not because it's beautiful or nice or wonderful, it's because all management is being transformed anyway. It's just safety management is a bit slow. Now, imagine you're in the bank, 
you got a lot of business processes that are quite similar, right? I, I you know, take my money from my bank and send it to Alexandra, and that's a business process that goes, and it goes on. It's similar in many, many different cases. So it's easy to put up a pipeline in IT. In management, safety management, it's usually different. It's usually lots of small different processes that have to work together. So it's more complicated, maybe more expensive to set up a system like that. But in the end, because it is a management system, it will be uh, supported in its entirety. Now, the million dollar question is how we're going to do this. Okay. And I must say, when I made this slide you know, years ago, I really thought it was a million dollar question, but it's not. Okay. Try 60,000 euros. Okay. And you talk to people, like, can we help us out with some AI solution to make some kind of decision making process uh, better? I can't sell much more than 60,000 in commercial projects. So, so really, don't. Don't go there. Don't think you're going to get a million dollars because you're doing AI. It's really about solving a problem people have on a day-to-day -day basis and making it quicker. So just as a forewarning, I guess. But the work approach is not different from what you would do in a normal project. On a very high level, you'd have to define what your objectives are of the system, what you're trying to achieve. You've got to decide which tools you're going to use, so strategic tools and what, you know, what instruments you're going to use, implement it, find the right methods, train people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that information in terms of safety is not that intransparent. You look for ISO standard 31,000, it tells you exactly what people expect you to do when you do a safety management system. So um, those are great guidelines to get you going. In this particular case here, the image you see here is the Taking Safe Decisions Framework from the UK Railways. It has three distinct parts. On the left-hand side, the circle is safety monitoring. So you have trains, they operate, you need to correct data from them to see whether they're still safe. On the right hand side, you see making a change. That's where design safety is put in. So you can't just you know, build a train, put it on tracks. There's all kinds of safety uh, assurance processes that need to be performed before you can actually sell that train. That's on the right hand side. It has its own software as well, cold structure notation, that kind of stuff. And in the middle, you see commercial drivers and all this. That's really where your enterprise risk management system sits. So all these bits, have parts of them digitized that is just connected very well. But that will happen uh, uh, as time progresses uh, from where I sit. But it all, in many ways, it's a normal project in terms of how you set it up. Now, there is a twist to it, right? By the time you start talking to AI specialists, there's an interface, okay? So an expert, like a safety expert, like me or someone else that you happen to be working with, they have to communicate with the IT world. I find that's a difficult challenge in terms that in, in, in my environment, the safety experts that are not really keen to engage in digital transformation. And IT people are not necessarily very keen to talk to people who don't know anything about computers. So you need some kind of interface. In this case, we chose for business process modeling 2.0, which is around for a while. It's relatively transparent. It's the kind of stuff that safety managers still get. Okay. And there's some interface with the, uh, that IT work world knows as well. Actually, this business process here, the, let's say high level enterprise architecture design is the same picture as the one I showed before for taking safe decisions. It's just structured slightly different way, targeted more towards the individual tasks for, uh, for digital transformation. So bottom right, you see execution of RAMs. That is your assurance process. That's the right hand side of the taking safe decisions. Where you have the, the, the database, right? The activity surrounding it, that's where your monitoring is. And your enterprise management system is the Bota risk management system. So really, it's the same thing, just explained in a different way. So you can actually get better contact to uh, programmers and IT experts. I think that's an important part. Now about the bow tie. So um, once you get to the point that you understand what you want to be doing and understand you know, what your objectives are, you need to get into the nitty gritty of how you actually make that happen. And for many reasons, we chose the, the bow tie. And um, um, as I understand, not many of you are that familiar with the bow tie, so I'll do a brief introduction, but I will be talking about it a bit more through this presentation to warn you about the pitfalls about it. So fundamentally, it's a bow tie because you are drawing out a risk space, the area of elements that are all important to try and prevent one specific central event, a top event is called here. Uh, and there's some rules of setting it up. I will just speak about it later, but you can imagine on the left-hand side, so the blue blocks, you'll see things that can happen. So you get into trouble, right, to the top event. And after you're in the top event, there's different ways of getting uh, or escalating to, to, to summarize just how big the damage is going to be. 
And that's really what this is about. It's a bow tie structure like to so look at Tor, right? With its, with its, so that's why it's a, why it's a bow tie. Okay, that's a, <laughs> and it's been designed in the early 90s. So in safety working environment, there's quite a lot of experience with it. Now, this is a good and a bad thing at the same time. It's good because there are people out there who know how bow ties work. It's, because, it's bad because everybody does whatever they want with it. Okay, so you can use the bow tie as an accident investigation tool. So uh, just saying, studying an accident, what went wrong, there should have been a barrier here, this threat materialized, we, hadn't, we didn't know before, so you get very strange shaped bow tie. Then there's uh, all kinds of colorful ways of designing these things. So it's a little bit different. If you go to the web, if you go to the internet, just type bow tie, you find lots and lots of bow ties and none of them work for you if you want to digitize stuff. So there's, there's a neck to that. But what you get that right, it's a good tool to not only control the business process that you have uh, uh, operational, but also to facilitate orchestration and data management and introduce AI to the premises. Okay, actually, it's this simple. You buy this book and follow it to the letter, and this is the end of my presentation. All right, all right, I'll, I'll say that again. Okay, buy this book, do what it says to the letter, and you get the bow tie you need, and from that, you don't need anymore. <laughs> Okay, well, it's slightly more complicated than that, but th that is true. If you follow this structure well, you will end up with the, the right boat. Of course, there's some experience involved and, you know, I haven't done this before, but the bottom line is this book is really the best way in it. The boat that you see here, I appreciate the letters are a little small here. They're about a train, uh, uh, it's a train boat. Tie. It's a little easier for me to speak about trains within this context because actually the majority of my work has taken place. Um, so you will just go through that. So, so the rules, let's say, of making this work for you. So the first important rule is this bow tie has to be a something that's real world. It has to describe something that's really out there. If you drive trains, it's a real business process. If you manufacture robots, if you fly aeroplanes, if you, I don't know, sail ships, drill oil, doesn't really matter what. It has to be existing a real world system. And that means that, you, that there are some assumptions before you even start making the bow tie. Your systems are normally fit for purpose and working as may be expected. So are people and equipment. Now that sounds a little strange, but you wouldn't be in business if you hadn't had this right. You can't drive trains if you don't have uh, uh, proficient drivers. Uh, you cannot start drilling for oil if, you're, if your equipment is, is, is inadequate. So those things you have to assume for a bow tie to develop a bow tie, that these things are there and working. They're not necessarily always working the way you want them to, but they are working. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be in business. So you wouldn't have a bow tie to make to begin with. Um, next step, hazards. So the hazard is here, uh, the top one in the apoplectic colors, right? It's a train in motion. If you drive trains, that's a normal business process, something you do every day. You don't want to focus your bow ties and things that you do from time to time. Right? You don't want to speak about this one update that you once a month or something. You want to talk about the things you do every day to cause risk to you every day. It has to be a normal state that causes risk to exist. In this case, it's train in motion. You drive trains, this is going to happen. The train is going to be in motion. Then the loss of control, and this is actually a tricky one. That has to be an observable event where you lose control over your process. So you are driving a train. Now imagine when, what's the point where you think to yourself, you know, I no longer know what's going to happen next. I'm not certain whether my train is still going to do what I want it to do when a certain condition is met. And you want it to be observable because if it's not observable, you can't get data for it. Okay. So it has to be something detectable, observable, measurable. Otherwise, it's just not much point in making that a central event. In this case, we've chosen train not driven to speed. That sounds a little strange, but you know, trains, when they over the tracks, they have a maximum speed. If you're above that, you know, you don't necessarily wreck the train, but you could, but you don't really know whether you would or you could or you should. If it's too slow, actually, it could be a problem as well, because you have all kinds of different problems uh, uh, within traffic later on. So by the time you're not at the street that you're supposed to be or in the bandwidth is it, you're actually no longer in control. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, as I said, necessarily mean you derail, but you can, so you don't want to be doing that. Um, now we get to the threats. That's, that's the real observable situation that uh, can cause the loss of control without any help. And we call it a single point of failure, the safety, uh, safety domain. So something that happens 
And if you don't do something about it, you can just automatically end up in the train of alternative speed. So I've circled here a change in line in the speed. So sometimes when this works on the railways, trains have to drive slower, but not at the normal line speed. So it'll be a sign saying, okay, we've got works up ahead, drive slower. That board being there or that, that uh, process being put in place is, is a threat to a drive because if they miss it somehow, they'll be automatically driving the wrong speed. So immediately into in trouble. Uh, it has to be observable again, because you want to measure where you go into trouble. If, if you, you can't measure it, there's no data, there's no nothing. Okay, it doesn't help. Could be caused by system change. In this case, it's uh, in this case a system change. Could be system fault. Could be some external uh, factor that be uh, your threat. But they're all basically uh, coming down to the same rules. All right, here's the important bit, the barrier. Now say you've got your train, you're driving on a piece of track. A lane, a line uh, speed change is up ahead. You're, you're approaching it. Then there has to be some kind of mechanism to tell you, to, to warn you that something's happened here. Let's say uh, a signboard in this case. So that's a way to warn the driver. This is where you need to pay attention. You need to do something, okay? But the barrier is not functional until it has three basic functions fill out one you have to be able to detect the error you have to be have to have some logic to decide what to do next then you have to do it and all of this has to take to taken place between on the causal path from the threat to the train plot written in speed so usually we're talking seconds or minutes or hours okay that's the normal time frame if your protection system does not fit within that uh time space within the causal chain, it's not a barrier, it's something else. So training people is not a barrier, not in this way. Because you can't, you know, from the time that you pass the, the signal saying you need to drive slower here, and the time you're actually driving too fast, you can't send people to a lesson or to a course, train them, get them back in the train and, uh, and, uh, and behave accordingly, right? It doesn't work that way. So that's not a barrier. So actually, many of the barriers that you see in bow ties on the internet would actually not be placed here if you follow the methods shown here. Why is this important? This greatly simplifies your bow tie. So you'll find in that massive bow tie of hundreds of elements. Actually, by the time you've got more than five barriers, you know there's some structural error in the construction of the bow tie, and this is what it is. All right, so just about this detect, determine, act is very important. A detector can be a human, a person can see something's going wrong. They can also use their brain to say something's wrong, I need to press a button. Could also be completely automated. A machine detects the train's going too fast, automatic intervention and some logic involved. But it has to be the closed loop. If it's not a closed loop, it's not a barrier. So that means that the barrier is a number of business processes, a number of parts that have to be present and you can check whether they work. And that's really where the data comes in. Is the detector still working? Is the logic still working? Is the actuator working? Or is, and if it's a person, are they well enough trained to actually perform the task that the barrier demands of them? So that's really the barrier. Now we get to the holes in the cheese. So I'm not sure, I don't think this has many safety uh, uh, workers in the group, but it's about holes in the cheese and that's this. This is reasons Swiss cheese model. So let's say you have a barrier. We talked about the signboard earlier. So the signboard itself is fine. There's a business process. You put the signboard out, everybody should be seeing it. But now it's, now it's poor visibility. So all the business processes are working as normal, but you, it's like, like making a hole in a cheese. It's all there, but there's a hole here because you can't see it fast enough. How it gets bigger, you know, if you got more fog or something, it gets smaller if you could draw, if you get less, uh, better visibility. So that's where this is the holes of the cheese uh, 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 way of looking at things. And this is actually, it's like a threat. It's like a threat, but it's not, so the yellow box here, but it's not something that on its own would cause the accident, cause the logic effect. So there's a different, an important differentiation. It causes the barrier to malfunction. It doesn't cause the accident. Okay, there's a very important difference here because you can have lots of escalation factors. If you have a signboard as a normal business process out, there's many ways in which that signboard doesn't work. Vegetation, uh, fog could be blown over, could be lights could be broken. There's many ways in which that barrier itself doesn't fail. But the fact that the barrier doesn't work is not the cause of the accident itself. So that's an important uh, differentiator. 
Now, and of course, once you got those kind of threats, you can defend against this, those again, right? These are escalation barriers. They look like uh, both are barriers, but they're escalation factors. And they here, actually, the rules are a little less strict. They don't, ha they don't have to fit within the causal path of the accident itself. So you have, for poor visibility, you could have vegetation management, which means if it's about trains, you know, go past all the tracks that you have, cut all the grass, cut the trees, make sure that's all, you know, in place, visible, et cetera, et cetera. That's a management process. It's a huge management process, okay? And it's a fundamentally very important business process, but it's not a barrier. It's an escalation barrier. Uh, so you want to put energy in it, but not put it in the causal path. So this is where things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, I could say a bit about human error management because people tend to say it's always a human's fault, right? When things go wrong within the boat, it's a little complicated. You don't want to put human error as a threat to accidents because let's say I forget something, right? The driver, I forget, I have to stop him for the red signal. So that would be unlikely, but I mean, let's say I forget. It's not measurable and it happens. And it's very difficult to, to put it in a bow tie as a threat because it's very difficult to nail down exactly what the conditions are. It's not measurable, different find the conditions. So human factors are usually not in the threats. Actually, you get really strange bow ties here. Uh, and it really doesn't work if you want to digitize stuff. Okay, I spend a lot of time on this because I want you to get this right, okay? You go and get the structure right, you might not as well start with the data at all. There's no point, okay? First, make sure you get the structure right. Know what you want to be looking for, know what you're protecting against and understanding which elements are important in your control system. So first of all, by construction, you, you know, you understand what can happen and what you can do about it, what you're actually doing about it. Now don't fantasize about, it would be great if we would have another barrier here about, I don't know, uh, uh, the icing or something, but we're not doing that on a regular basis. And we're not paying anyone to do that either. We're not training anyone, so we're not actually doing that. It would be good to have, but we don't have it. Don't put it in the bow tie. Okay, not in your operational boat, that just doesn't help. It also tells you what kind of information required because now you know which bits of your system are critical. And you want to know, I have the information about, is this critical bit still working? That's where your data comes in. That's where you want to gather information from your own system or dedicated data systems and say, okay, this bit we know works. And we know, we know that it works and we know why it works. Um, now, interestingly, this bow tie in its entirety also provides a map for the integration. Given that you have maybe 10 or 15 very, very different bow ties, right? Just imagine, sometimes it's a massive IT. So let's say, let's, let's take the vegetation management, right? Okay, hundreds of people on GB railways have to cut trees on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a massive information system, lots of contracts and all kinds of things, you know, that all that information, but the only does one thing, control that one barrier, right? Is it still working? In another uh, uh, barrier, it might just be visual inspection of a piece of track. So it's just like handwritten records, this is still okay. Somehow they need to be on par in terms of your safety control and the bow tie is perfect for that. It just gives you where these things fit and how important they are relevant to each other. And from that point on, really, it becomes just IT. And uh, in the work we've done uh, back in Huddersfield, and I'm also propagating here, but it looks like we're gonna go for different data systems here. Uh, we use a graphical uh, graphical database, uh, a um, Neo4j graphical database. Because, and there's two good reasons for that. One is it's graphical, okay? So safety experts can also understand rather than just understanding how code works. They could just look at the pictures. And the other thing is that um, it's very flexible. It's not just that you can put in your meta model as a structure, but you can also put the data in there as well and do some uh, some basic analysis as well. So here's a picture here at the top. Yeah, I appreciate again, the letters a little small. So when you got your uh, presentation that you can have a better look, but at the top it says bow tie. This is really the, the meta model described. So here's with defined what's a bow tie. So in the, in the note, there will be a description of what the bow tie is, the kind of link it has to hazards, to top events. On the left-hand side, the threat, but it's at a consequence. And at the bottom, you see how the bear. So that's the basic, uh, 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 ontological structure, let's say, of the bow tie. And you just populate it, okay? We just draw on the bow tie, you just draw it in. So this is the same thing. You still have the, uh, uh, the ontology, ontological model is still there, still sits in the database. You just connect it to actual barriers that you came up with that have to be connected here. You'll find here change in speed, right? The one we looked at, automatic route setting, et cetera, et cetera. 
together with all escalation factors and this and that. And you can actually, I've drawn one layer of escalation factors. We can have escalation factors on escalation barriers. You can have multi-layered if, if you wanted to. Makes it complicated. So we we'll try not to do that, but, uh, but you could just model it here in this graphical, graphical database. And then you connect the data. Okay, so now you know what barrier you're worried about. And then you find yourself data that tells you something about the state of that barrier. Uh, I'll just explain two uh, examples we've been working on uh, as part of work back in Huddersfield. Uh, um, one of them is the MIRC algorithm for a barrier, mostly on the, on the threat. And the other one's just using textual analysis about information about barriers. So not necessarily about the state of the barrier, but about incidents in relation to the barrier. So the first is, and it's actually a little technical, I've got some reference to a paper uh, further down this presentation you could use later on, but what the situation is as follows. When a train traverses a piece of track, there's a number of data sources associated. One of them is the data recorder on the train, the OTDR at the bottom. So every between one and 10 seconds, there's data storage, storing the train speed, location, appearance of a horn, warning people that their signal is upcoming. Another data source is the, what we call the RADS data. That's really information about the signaling system, when the signal goes from red to green to yellow, et cetera. While well, connecting those two, we can actually sense, or we can actually measure whether a train is approaching a red signal. And it might sound strange to you, but we never knew. Before we did this analysis, we never knew how often the train actually approaches the red signal. We know what happens. We do counts and there's some statistical modeling, but we never actually knew which signals are, are approached very often at red, which ones are not. So it says something about the risk profile, about the threat in this particular case. Interestingly, that data just goes into the, into the graph database. So it's a little complicated picture here again. I'm sorry for that, but this, the purple bu bubbles, they are data points from the train with speed, brake, et cetera, et cetera. The red and the greens, they're from the signaling system. So a green dot is when a train enters a berth that has at the end of it, the green signal. And then the red one is when the train enters a piece of track where the end of that track is a red signal. So you'll see, and again, let, letters are a little small, but you'll see here at the bottom from left to right, you see that the train enters a berth at the, that is red at that point, it slowly traverses, and as it comes close to the signal, it picks up speed, that's because the signal by the time is clear to green. So now we have some idea, we can make some algorithms to assess whether this train is in any danger whilst approaching this red, red signal. And, um, and in fact, we found a couple of incidents where we see actually this train is going way too fast to red signal. And the driver is depending on their memory or their experience that, you know, by the time they get there, it's going to go to green, but they're not quite sure. And people do it in the cars all the time, don't they? Okay, we do it in trains as well. We really don't want it because the train takes long to stop. Anyway, so that's where it's a fairly straightforward algorithm. It's a particular case that's also described in the paper. In the meantime, our colleagues have progressed with it where you also have if, where if missing data, you can also make that kind of prediction whether there's a red signal approach, yes or no. And then the interesting, interesting bit is when the speed is very high at that point. Okay, so that's where AI actually enters the equation. Here we have uh, the second example. That's where we use text. So on the GB railways, there's a near miss recording system and it's got about 300,000 recordings per year. All right, so that'd be like uh, anyone at the railway can, just can use a phone and just type you know, whatever they think is wrong or, or dangerous on the railways. This is one of those, those texts that we found this maybe five years ago. Sorry, escape. Bit of, bit of. And then you, again, put in a graph database, split it up into words, and then basically do some text analysis here. This is done by my colleagues. It's reported in a paper. Again, uh, I'll share later, where you just basically filter out you know, what risk we're talking about here. And from that, really you get to some kind of histogram as you can see here in relation to an existing bow tie. Now this is an actual real railway bow tie that I didn't make, okay? <laughs> I'll just, yeah. There's a good reason why you can't read the letters here because all proprietary information, but the bottom line is here, we're collecting information from text that people are just putting in with cold fingers, misspelled, wrong letters, punctuation, uh, and just map it onto a bow tie to see which risks are occurring. In this particular case, uh, I think it's, it's um, missing equipment or something that people are forgetting their equipment when they go to work. Uh, that happens a lot. So you get a histogram there. Um, and these kinds of things that tells you something about the performance of your, of your risk space. Now from there really, uh, now so now we have a database with a number of different 
kinds of data in it, a number of different uh, uh, algorithms associated to text analysis. I mean, this particular uh, text analysis method is fairly straightforward, doesn't require that much AI, but you can use AI like text analysis tools as well, not necessarily inside the graph database. You take the data out, process, put it back. So there's a number of ways to do that. But in the end, you'll have something like this where this way, the yellow dots, they're the threats, the gray dots, they are the uh, barriers, and then the, the red and purple and green at the bottom, they're actually data in relation to your, to your bow tie. You make an output file and you read it into uh, commercial software. In this case, you use CGE uh, Bowtie XP commercial software, just read the data in and to display it to users. Uh, so that's really how, that's, how that trick works. Now, what's important to understand here, any data will do, Okay, as long as you understand which barrier you're, you're controlling, you want to know how well it's working, whatever data you could get a hands on, you know, uh, is game here. That could be data that you collect on purpose, like audits, right? An audit into the barrier, you could collect that kind of data. You could also get information like we did from near misses, saying something about this particular barrier. But it could also be information from a SAP system that you happen to have on planning, on inspection, on, I don't know, measurements of some kind. And uh, uh, that really becomes just what kind of KPI do you need to tell you that this barrier is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then in the end, of course, for the whole bow tie, you want to connect all these bits. So you get an, a picture of the risk as in its entirety. And, and from there, it's just work, okay? Then you can just, you know, try and find better, faster, more shiny AI or, or, or systems, but you have to describe the system well. So in maybe just wrap slowly getting to an end here. So this data well does have a lot to offer for safety. It does, it will be coming your way, whether you like it or not. We can see actually here in the Netherlands, there's quite a few IT companies slowly picking up safety solutions as well. I mean, the Bote XP software has been around for a long time as a descriptive software, but they're also moving into more interpretive software uh, uh, using AI, but they're also independent uh, software supplies now getting into this business of uh, uh, of managing safety. And it's coming your way, whether you like it or not. Okay, and that's something, I, especially for my safety colleagues, they don't like it, but they're gonna have to use to work with that. I do think the boat is an efficient way to orchestrate data and solutions uh, in, in this space. Of course, you don't have to use bow tie. Okay, there's different methods you could use, but the rules are more or less the same. You have to be very, very strict in designing the system to describe the problem that you're trying to, uh, to, uh, to capture yet, yeah, to get the model right. Just some reflections on maybe working forward toward AI uh, from a utilitarian perspective, right? It just, it can make your work easier and cheaper. So we have a number of solutions where you can read thousands of incident reports and tell me something about COVID, right? Which or how often does it happen? Where does it happen? What kind of conditions would be around there? So there's that kind of stuff works. And actually in the UK, we had 300,000 of reports every year we went to go to for vegetation management for uh, a near business, that kind of stuff. Um, you can help yourself protect the decisions and adjustment you want to do. Uh, um, and you can uh, make sure that people are standing by. So that's a little bit more in the future. Let's say the vegetation management, if let's say the number of vegetation uh, registrations goes be a, above a certain threshold, you hire more people. Okay, just to make sure you, you control that a bit better. I think the real discussion here, what kind of level of autonomy are you willing to delegate to, uh, to AI, especially in the face of the legal consequences of creating an accident. From a worker's perspective, and this is something from TNO, I get a bit more work on uh, the foresight report from EU OSHA is actually quite alarming when it says how when, when staff start working with AI solutions, they get quite stressed. Uh, uh, they worry about whether they can cope physically and mentally with AI systems. They're afraid of who's in control. And this is especially poignant in the discussion of Uber, right? Uber drivers are not necessarily in control of their working conditions, and that's, that's troublesome for them. And people also worry about whether they keep relevant. It's all very neatly described in this EU OSHA report. And discussion really is how can you, how can artificial and human intelligence actually collaborate respectfully? And the last reflection I'd love to put in here is the cognitive capabilities of people working with it. And that's really in an IEC report we wrote for, uh, yeah, what I wrote for IEC on the future of safety, where it was quite clear that you know, it's not that much off when this machine is going to be vastly more intelligent than the person, and how do you actually work with that? How do you make how do you make sure 
still in control of that. Uh, and the same time also how do you call machines to be sensitive to cognitive limitations? And this is really European thing, okay? In Americas or Asia, you know, they don't always necessarily care, but in Europe there's quite wrong legislation about uh, human rights and uh, how to call that. There's a lot of debate there. So the question really is what kind of oversight mechanisms do you need for those kind of things? Well, maybe just, just wrapping up here uh, from my side, uh, to me, it feels that the progress in the safety domain with AI or without AI feels like they baby steps, but it is, you know, it is going forward. Not maybe as fast as I would hope it to go forward maybe five years ago, uh, but it is uh, supporting safety management and it is actually uh, progressing, but slowly from my perspective. Uh, it's not about AI for the sake of AI, it's where I add to the existing endeavors that you're already doing, okay, like safety. And not so necessary, so don't try to get all the information in one big heap, get some AI engine to tell you something about safety, it just doesn't work. You need to have the structure to get the information out that you really need. So that's why you use AI, not just because it's beautiful and you hope for the best. So in that sense, it's also keep your feet on the ground, right? It doesn't give you any alien powers. It's really just accelerating what you're already doing. And there's no emergent property, okay? There already was intelligence. It's just mechanical now. So that's not an emergent property. We already knew how to do things in intelligence. It just makes it faster. Because so really uh, keep your feet on the ground with the kind of promises there. Just wrapping up here for the uh, Norwegian Cognitive Center, I've been looking through your websites. I think uh, that's one of the points, education and understanding are cornerstones in your program. I think that's really spot on. It's very important in all of that. Uh, I don't think just about AI, you also need to get the interface with the experts to make sure that you, uh, that you're in sync with the user group. I fully support all these AI solutions to support human endeavor. So I'm really interested to see what you do. And you've got great partners there. So I'm really eager to see how you progress beyond this. It looks like a really good setup from that perspective. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. If you've got any questions, see my email address and we will be circulating this presentation uh, after today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cohen. Uh, Tord, uh, could you please ask some <laughs> uh, qualified questions to Cohen? Yes, uh, thank you, Cohen. This is a very interesting also uh, presentation and also within uh, the area of uh, safety. Um, I've been also in that area, also formerly because of my background, was a, a commercial pilot as well, and I've been in rescue services in a way. But currently I also work with cybersecurity. And um, uh, how do you see, what do you call it, the, the adoption and use of the bow tie model as you presented uh, to covering the cybersecurity side? Um, and also the relation for that. All right, that's a good question. So I know of some companies that actually use bow ties uh, for cybersecurity, so to map out their risk space. Um, those are sizable companies that have uh, that have some effort. In I've actually never seen what the bow tie actually looks like. I just know that they are using that structure. Uh, in terms of trying to map out the risk space. For them, the problem really is that mm. um, for them, it's easier to get access to data. So they, they, because there's log files on what's happening on these machines, they will know what kind of things are happening. So counting for them is a little easier, but there'll be many different types of attacks they need to take into account. So on the threat side, you get an enormous forest of different things that could happen to you. Uh, so that's really where their problem is to 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 think about what is this a new threat? Is this an existing threat? Is this protection functional? Does it do what we hope it it does? And how do we check whether it actually performs well? But they've got an advantage. So they've got an advantage from the data side, collecting the right data. But they've got a disadvantage in terms of uh, knowing what can happen. So so if you've got you know a rigid system like a railway system or manufacturing or that kind of stuff you basically at some point you just know what can go wrong and in in, in cyber security you, can, you could just can be surprised yeah so that's the major difference i guess there is also a close connection to the digitalizing uh digital transformation also as well and use of the iot ot uh in particular for industry for seven uh yes. which everything sensor is on the net and i guess the, the security will also compromise the safety 
Yeah, so that's actually, um, that debate's been going on for a couple of years now. And uh, I think EU in its entirety hasn't really decided yet how to deal with that. But I think recently the UK have decided that um, cybersecurity is integral and subordinate to safety. So they'll say, if you want to, for a train, for instance, if you want to operate a safe train, you need to cover safe security as well as part of your safety management system. So they've rolled it oh. up in one. And I think there's still a lot of debate how to do that well, but there that decision has been made. And, I, and I'm not sure about the States, but uh, in Europe, that debate's still ongoing. So for instance, the oh. machine directive, which is the, the standardization for you know, CE marking on your machines, is basically a risk analysis of safety for any machine. But that doesn't have um, AI or cybersecurity in it yet, and that's being debated right now. Mm. So it's, it's interesting course of topic, yeah, I guess, uh, Colin, because it's about uh, uh, resilience engineering also as well. You're talking about the existing uh, operation. If you have an existing operation area, uh, then you can build a, a bow tie model as a storytelling and structure it to collect the big data as well uh, to get a deeper analysis on it. But but in, in regarding of the what do you call it the the, the, uh, the, the fast technology development, uh, we also design new services that are, are not ready yet. So so would you say that this what do you call it methods and tool sets and framework is this also valid for resilient engineering to be what do you call it try to design it in a proper way and and, and, and to test it along the the project phase of, of, of the, uh, the investment um, yeah so that's there's there's so I don't think there's a definite answer to it let me let me put it that way so the the, the approach could be the same but then you need to go yeah. this engineering model okay I, I, I haven't been convinced uh, to date by particularly well structured resilience engineering models that tell me what to be looking out for. But that, uh, mm. uh, so that makes it a little difficult, but in, in principle, the method is the same. The fact that it's mm. new is, is difficult in many ways, because if you do not have information about, you know, what could theoretically go wrong here, then to some extent, you're just hoping for the best and you're putting into place. Normally what you do is you put like generic barriers in place that you hope will protect you against a number of threats that are not completely known just yet. Those you could still manage and you could still map out uh, uh, what kind of threats actually occur as a function of time. But there the chance is a bit more like the cybersecurity. You would want to map out in how many ways you actually get yourself in trouble. So it's, I could, I'd say it'd be a little bit between the reliability engineering and the, uh, uh, the safety management and the uh, cybersecurity management. It's a bit between there. Some bits you know, some bits you yeah. don't know. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Is there uh, any questions from the audience? I would also like to ask a question. I was wondering, so I come from a background of producing a ton of data in a digital, in a system that is already digital and like a shot, shotgun type of approach, basically just produce a ton of data and try and find the parameters that I'm looking for in that way. Um, and so I'm wondering, I was wondering whether you see any role for the Bowtie model specifically for yeah, digital systems that are already digital, also for example, cybersecurity systems like Toinge mentioned, uh, to build a Bowtie model basically completely from the bottom up using the data. Um, yeah, or do, do you know of examples where that is already done or yeah, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I do know people are trying. I guess in the same way you are trying, as as from my perspective, uh, that's fine. It's fine if you if you go from the bottom up because, in the end, you need evidence to support that uh, that a threat you know is a real threat, and and you might have overlooked it. So if you have data to tell you that this is a threat, uh, that, that it's fine to 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 build it from the bottom up. I would advise to to stick to this definition. So so when you think some data tells you something, you'd have to think about what exactly does it tell me in relation to my safety management does it tell me that i'm no longer in control so is it an loc event or does it tell me that a problem is uh, occurring a threat is occurring 
or is this a barrier that's failing or is this a escalation effect? So it actually, the, the exercise is similar, but you go from the bottom up, but you have to recognize which bit of the risk space you're looking at. So that's the difficulty in that sense. And in terms of uh, your one shot, actually, I love that stuff. And because uh, uh, once, uh, once you've decided this is a barrier we need to be looking at, this is exactly where you do your one shots. What information do we have? Can we extract something or that says something about this particular barrier? So uh, the method of work doesn't change that much. And whether you go top to bottom or bottom to top doesn't matter that much, but from the top to bottom, basically you don't know exactly what algorithms you'll be looking for. And from bottom to top, you don't really know it's what parts of your control mechanisms you're looking at. So, but if you can connect those two, uh, there shouldn't be any problem. Okay, so, so uh, to end up, um, risk might be very, what do you call it, a little bit confusing and also to, to hard to understand in a holistic point of view. So it's about storytelling and, and get insight uh, rather than just making the spreadsheet and, and uh, have, have done the paperwork. So it's more in to put that in, in, in a visual uh, perspective, understand it, have a common understanding of the risk picture and also taking the next step uh, to have a deeper insight uh, in, in combination with the AI and uh, machine learning. But I think anyhow, to, to have a common understanding from the risk picture, it can be simplified also to build a model to get a common understanding, even if, if it's process risk or it's a more informational side of, of, of the, the risk picture. And uh, combine the cybersecurity problem also uh, when it's compromised the, the, the business process and, and also the value creation. And if it's train operation or, or any, anyhow in, in the agriculture or, or health industry. So, uh, but Cohen, uh, what we can do also uh, after the meeting, um, uh, NCC and also we have, have been established a LinkedIn group uh, with your cognitive center and uh, where we can provide an offer, uh, what do you call it, the free entry trial package and also to provide more deeper insight if there are any interest in that uh, as a follow up. Yes. So, um, uh, I've, uh, post I've posted the link to the uh, forum uh, on the chat, so people can go into there and uh, just follow that page. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, Cohen and uh, Tor and Alexandra for the uh, presentations. And I will, um, on the 8th of February, we have a workshop and uh, lecture by Morten Goodwin. There is two available spots left. Um, we only have 50 participants. And um, so if you want to attend there, you have to go into our uh, Norwegian Cognitive Center.com and uh, just register there. Thank you very much for today's presentation and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Odd. And uh, we also catch up in, in, in a continuous uh, connection in also the LinkedIn group. I think that would be good. Uh, yes. Okay. Have a nice evening. All right. Bye. Bye.